Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Ed Krupp, Director of Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles, California. On January 17, 1994, at 4.31 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, everyone in Los Angeles got out of bed at the same time. That's when the Northridge earthquake occurred, and many people were propelled out of their houses and apartments by fear and danger. At Griffith Observatory, we started receiving peculiar telephone inquiries within a day, and they persisted for at least a week. People called to ask us about that odd sky they saw right after the earthquake, and they wanted to know if it had anything to do with the disaster. The staff, of course, was puzzled by these calls at first, but after a number of them, it became apparent what people were talking about, the stars. The earthquake had knocked out the power throughout most of Los Angeles, and that put out the lights. From their streets and yards on January 17, residents of Los Angeles saw the night sky, something they never see, except perhaps under the dome of the planetarium, where we preserve the stars like an endangered species. It hasn't always been like this. Ancient, prehistoric, and traditional people have had access to the sky. They used it. It was their clock, their calendar, their compass, and the activator of their world. Less than a hundred years ago, Chief Francisco Potencio of the Palm Springs Indians was still able to recall an incomplete account of a sun-watching technique employed by the tribe. Chief Potencio, in his stories and legends of the Palm Springs Indians, spoke of the primordial people. He wrote, In this tribe were some older people who put up the signs to gauge how the sun shone. They found that they had to keep moving the stick to the right for a long time and then to the left. And so by this means, they discovered what times the birds had their nests, what times the animals had their young, also what time the plants grew and the time the seeds were ripe. This they did year after year as they studied the signs of the sun. While we know people have been keeping track of the seasons with the sun, moon, and stars for thousands of years. And it's reasonable to think we've been doing this for tens of thousands of years and maybe more. When our ancient and prehistoric ancestors tried to understand their place in the universe, they reached for answers from the sky. They used the sky as a tool and incorporated it into temples and tombs and myths and rituals and even observatories. For them, there was a mythological, ceremonial, and symbolic aspect to the sky. From Stonehenge to the American Southwest, from the royal burials of Egypt to the palaces of Imperial China, we've identified ancient monuments and prehistoric shrines where the ancients watched the fundamental movements of the sun, moon, stars, and planets. They recognized in them an underlying pattern and celebrated in celestial symbolism the alliance between earth and sky. The study of this response has come to be called archaeoastronomy, and because that's not such a familiar term, it's reasonable to ask what it is. Fundamentally, it's a word with too many vowels. Despite that awkward orthography, archaeoastronomy has come to mean the interdisciplinary study of prehistoric, ancient, and traditional astronomies worldwide within their cultural context. It all sort of began with Stonehenge, which has been said to incorporate significant astronomical alignments into the arrangement of its monumental stones. This view, in fact, coincides with the direction of the rising sun on the summer solstice in June. At the time, the sun appears to rise as far to the north as it is ever seen from this location. And you can watch the migration of the sunrise or the sunset from any location on the horizon, and over the course of a year, you will see that event gradually moving from north to south and back again, and carrying with it, of course, the seasons of the year. In a way, that mention of the summer solstice really tells the story. There are things that drive people to pay attention to the sky, 
But foremost among them, the thing that makes a difference is the seasons. That seasonal cycle, that cycle of seasonal change affects the weather and the food supply, and it sets the boundary conditions on what we do. The modern study of this kind of thing, modern archaeoastronomy, began with Stonehenge, and that's because the British-American astronomer Gerald S. Hawkins examined the astronomical potential of Stonehenge in a paper in 1963 and subsequently published a best-selling book on the subject and starred in a CBS television show that showcased his analysis and staged the subject uh, as a conflict between a flashy young astronomer and a skeptical archaeological establishment. In fact, neither the facts nor the personalities were portrayed entirely accurately, but it was rousing commercial TV, and it helped put Stonehenge and archaeoastronomy on the map. Archaeoastronomy really began, however, about seven decades before Gerald Hawkins seemingly decoded Stonehenge, when another British astronomer, Sir J. Norman Lockyer, the distinguished founding editor of the now prestigious scientific journal Nature, and the astronomer who discovered the element helium in the sun, examined the alignments of ancient Egyptian temples. And he published his results and his thoughts in a book, The Dawn of Astronomy. Lockyer encountered considerable criticism from Egyptologists, however, and much of it was deserved. Although he was, in some respects, on the right track, he, he did not do all of his homework on Egypt and speculated rather wildly about Egyptian history and myth. And as a consequence, the study of ancient astronomy went dormant until Hawkins kickstarted it back into business in the 1960s with his solar and lunar alignments at Stonehenge. There is, however, more to archaeoastronomy than monuments that point to the seasonal limits of the sun and the varying monthly excursion of the moon. It includes written records and the unwritten archaeological record. For example, this page from the Dresden Codex, an ancient Maya screen-fold manuscript, uh, probably composed in the 13th century in Yucatan, uh, records uh, Maya ideas about the appearance of the planet Venus in numerical terms that relate to its appearances and disappearances from the sky. On the other hand, the archaeological record includes all kinds of things. Uh, for example, uh, this pictograph panel from Chaco Canyon, New Mexico. Although its exact meaning eludes us, the most likely explanation is, is that it documents a conjunction between the bright planet Venus and the waxing crescent moon. Well, archaeoastronomy then embraces calendars and practical observation, sky lore and celestial myth, symbolic representations of celestial objects, concepts and events, astronomical orientation of tombs and temples and shrines and urban centers, uh, symbolic displays that involve celestial phenomena in the natural environment, traditional cosmology, and, and ceremonial application of astronomical tradition. And although archaeoastronomy is most often associated with astronomical alignments in the monumental architecture, like Stonehenge or uh, North American medicine wheels, ancient ancestral Pueblo buildings in the American Southwest, Mesoamerican temple platforms, and Egyptian pyramids and temples. Its true scope establishes it as an anthropology of astronomy. For example, plenty of texts and iconography confirm that the Egyptians kept the calendar. The ceiling of the great hypostyle hall of the Ptolemaic-era temple of Hathor at Dendra in Upper Egypt personifies the days of the waxing moon up there on the ceiling, as 14 gods ascending the stairs to the full moon at the top of the stairs. And the 14 days of the waning moon ride together in a boat in an adjacent panel. And this kind of thing is not restricted to Egypt. In Suzhou, China, a Taoist temple, the Xuanmiao Guan, has 60 statues in cases around the interior perimeter. 
Each one of these statues corresponds to one of the years in the 60-year cycle that is formed by all of the possible combinations of the five so-called elements with the 12 years of the Jupiter cycle. The statue for the current year is specially decorated for those visiting the temple with a religious intent. Astronomy, it could be argued, is the means by which societies seek to make their observations of the heavens intelligible, and that casts archaeoastronomy as a systematic, cross-cultural attempt to understand how prehistoric, ancient, and traditional societies do that. It is all about the interaction of the brain and sky, and it emphasizes practically everything in the cultural component of astronomy which is expressed in temples and tombs and iconography and in costume, in seasonally timed or astronomically inspired ritual and ceremony, in myth and calendars, clocks and urban planning, agriculture, hunting and gathering practices and prohibitions, divination, systems of kinship, royal protocol, vision quest shrines, transcendental journeys of the soul, worldview, and even astronomical observatories and instruments. It's a little different now, but the night sky is still important. It is our direct experiential route to the cosmos. It turns us into astronomers, and astronomy is crucial. Astronomy prompts the big questions, and the big questions invite wonder. Wonder drives the quest for understanding, and the quest for understanding invests value in accurate portrayals of nature and accurate portrayals of nature enhance survival. So the night sky helps underwrite our future.